challenging, mineral-rich Northern Australia, world food bowl of the future, is the scene of great activity, a Commonwealth state-assisted program of beef road development. A near-completed $22 million bitumen beef road system of about a thousand miles has opened up the vast cattle and sheep country from southwest Queensland to the Gulf of Carpentaria. I have gathered these stories afar, in the wind and the rain, in the land where the cattle camps are, on the edge of the plains. So said Banjo Patterson of Walsing Matilda fame, here at Winton, in the midst of Mitchell Grass Plains, a wool centre and cattle trucking depot. Western towns often seem alike, broad streets, old buildings, relics of more lusty days when pioneers passed in search of water and new grazing lands. Goats thrive where cows could scarce survive, and artesian water gushes, the only reliable source for animal and man. Homes and modes of transport are improving all the time. The beef road serves more than beef. National tourist safaris, sheep, wool and beef trains roar along the endless miles of bitumen highway, where yesterday wool wagons and early motor vehicles struggled on dusty winding tracks or through clinging mud. The Queensland Main Roads Department began surveying and planning the first stage of this thousand mile complex in 1960 and in 62 awarded tenders to local and interstate contractors. From isolated camps with few amenities, teams worked quickly to build these new sealed roads across brown soil plains, over rivers, and beautiful sandstone ranges from which Aboriginal tribes once spotted game or the white intruder. Many a first crazed man and beast have died chasing the elusive mirage in searing temperatures or found by luck a waterhole or soak. But these roads and the widespread discovery of artesian water are means of beating the effect of drought. To the west of Winton, in a collection of century-old timber houses and modern buildings, lives Boulia's outpost community on the bank of the Burke, crossed by Burke and Wills on their last great Australian trek in 1861. Boulia's home to the owners of this general store, supplying food and station gear, where these children of the plains do their weekend lessons as a group. Here on the black soil plains, on the edge of the famous Channel Country, much of Queensland's breeding cattle can become marooned as northern floods roll down the Burke, Georgina, Hamilton and a thousand shallow streams to South Australia and Lake Eyre. It's back to the lonely country again, but on a bitumen road spearing across windswept plains, on towards the Jarrah where roadside clumps of exotic desert flowers and grasses sprout near soaks, and out of sun-parched country burst into colourful profusion after rain. Our inbred sense of travelling comfort is shattered by the last 90 miles of dusty track beyond only the Jarrah, once wild country of warlike native tribes across black soil gibber country, where small groups of rangy cattle living on hope wander weakly into the dusk in search of food and water. Out of the gloom emerge the twinkling lights of Australia's greatest copper mine, an unexpected oasis in miles of open plains. Mount Isa was only discovered in 1923 by a stockman prospector. Now a city of over 17,000 people, it's a small United Nations, modern, self-sufficient, 
a desert community 600 miles from the coast. Vast annual sums are spent modernizing mine shaft operations and plant for lifting ore from increased underground drilling. The new crushing plant treats thousands of tons a day. This passes through vast concentrators, separating various minerals. Before crude copper becomes a molten white hot stream in smelting furnaces. Working in blistering heat and showers of sparks, furnacemen tap and guide the copper harvest to huge mobile buckets and banks of crude ingot moulds, ready for refining and export at Townsville. At day's end, shift workers by the thousands scurry from the workings to their comfortable homes in well-planned suburbs, many with solar heating systems and comforts to compensate for outback living. The Isa, like all western towns, had water problems. But a huge concrete wall across the trickling Leichhardt held the runoff after storms that soon filled Lake Mundara, a true oasis large enough to withstand five drought years. Roads converge on the Isa, and pleasure-starved people from hundreds of miles come shopping for fashions and fun. It's a frontier town, with an air of excitement unknown to city people. A great Australian, Flynn of the Inland, established what is now the Royal Flying Doctor Service for Outback Stations. With its daily contacts and school of the air, it's a lifeline Over. to isolated people of the north. Yes, good morning, Camillus. Over. Main Road's department plans for beef road and highway construction are supervised by local consulting engineers. On Mount Isa's outskirts, a new road begins. Experienced surveying teams carefully select the most suitable terrain and levels. Roads through rugged country and rich valley, where not so long ago, famous explorers, bushmen and prospectors struggled on horseback or foot in search of fame, wealth or better pastures. Surveying and pegging complete, modern equipment makes a mockery of the efforts of axemen and horse teams once used to clear the intended route through forests and towering mounds of anthill. Now, displacing the dependable horse drover, Beef trains make fast overnight runs from distant border properties near Camerwheel to Mount Isa. And to the east, the fast modern highway to Cloncurry, through red-tinted ranges of yet undiscovered wealth. Or the mothballed town of Mary Kathleen. Its world-rich uranium deposits profitably mined by Rio Tinto in the 1950s. The open cut and town lie ghost-like yet in perfect condition, ready for a new lease of life. On again to Cloncurry and the Corella River, crossed by Burke and Wills on their ill-fated trek, and other brave men who searched in vain across the land that also swallowed Leichhardt. Burke and Wills reached the Gulf at Burktown, 270 miles north, an area from which cattle now move south. So let us do the same. Like a cat with nine lives, Burktown may well rise again as beef production, fishing and iron ore deposits in the northwest corner expand. In the 1860s, a rollicking port town of about 500, a trading post for Cloncurry in the west, but now its age-old buildings a stark reminder of the past, a chapter for future historians. Times have changed. So too the mode of living of the earliest Australians, now part of a developing economy. And here, a new Shire Hall, a meeting place for local government and grazing leaders, who fly in hours what once took months to ride. Conference over, it's back home, speedily, in comfort. For those left behind, it's down to the pub to relax with a pint. Or gaze with a faraway look. It's everyone's pub, bosses, ringers and women folk, where it's good fellowship that counts and manners aren't so square. Having done your dash at cards the night before, what better fun than trolling for a barramundi in the Albert? where crockbait swims unaware of a furtive enemy beneath the water.
Tomorrow, it's back to the scrub for the big muster, patiently rounding up half-wild beasts at water holes and edging them quietly towards a larger mob. Skilled stockmen cut out the fats for market or better pastures. Mustering's on from dawn to dark, and the milling cattle, uneasy at the smell of men, move in swirling dust to sapling yards, where nimble ringers avoid sharp tossing horns and lashing hooves. Outback youngsters are part of mustering excitement, imitating stockmen heroes, and adding their prod or two as cattle move up the ramps into waiting trucks. Trapped and suspicious of every move, cattle move hesitantly, sniffing cautiously. Most graziers now prefer to track their cattle in all seasons. Beef road trains operating from the Gulf to the Channel Country have saved great mobs of drought-affected stock, but others have died. While the pick of the mob moved through Burketown to Cloncurry overnight, the stores and cows go back to breed and fatten for another year. Through the dust and into the dusk, groups of beef trains carrying hundreds of head move slowly over the choking bulldust tracks from property to beef road. Wide, shallow riverbeds like the Leichhardt are often a raging torrent in which Leichhardt himself may have perished. But before hitting the long trail, drivers take time off for a campfire meal and a chance for the cattle to settle down. On through the night. And at first light, the trains move quietly into Cloncurry and no time is wasted unloading the stiff-legged beasts after the long trip. Apprehensive owners and their families inspect the pens and await the auctioneer, when the fate of a year's hard work will be decided, whether the missus can have a new dress or the kids go to boarding school. The auctioneer mounts the rail and without delay the sale begins. What am I bid for this pen of Burktown fats? What about $130? The sale gathers momentum and lots knock down to the satisfaction of buyer and seller alike. Not many disappointed faces here today. Fat cattle, rumps marked, load into waiting trains for Townsville Meatworks. Others join road trains for restocking properties recovering after drought. The sale over, let's look at century-old Cloncurry, steeped in early Western history. A once boisterous trading town of sun-tempered cattlemen and miners. Now, more modern pursuits replace the noisy pubs and crowded courts of varied misdemeanors. Cattle, copper, and new world-sized phosphate finds at Duchess may mean a better life for district children taught in modern, well-staffed schools. And speaking of sports, everyone joins in here. In government-subsidized pools, budding champions train hard for competitions, and if lucky, a trip to the state championships. Perhaps not tennis stars or champion golfers, but nonetheless, it's fun by any standard. Though the betting's odds on against a hole in one on soft sand greens that must be carefully leveled, ah, oh! The curry's renowned for its annual rodeo, a supreme test for tough men born to the saddle. More exciting than a race meeting, the North homes in on the curry to back their favourites. A cunning last minute twist, and an unsuspecting rider parts company with his mount and hits the dust to roll away from flailing hooves. Among the best riders are station ringers, who after lifelong experience miss few animal tricks. It takes grit to sit a buck jumper for 10 seconds or longer before the pickup men wedge the horse and deftly pluck the rider off. It's a festival air for all, except the restive half-wild animals and self-conscious riders, whose confidence returns once the gate is open and the pitching, bucking animals begin their battle of wits. 
but others come for general fun. The sheer joy of watching children at play, or the thrilling sensation as the bucket goes over the top. While mother shows courage she doesn't feel, father's probably walked into a fistful of fives in the boxing tent. While some play, others work in the Cloncarry district office of the Main Roads Department, planning, constructing and maintaining roads. It's a satisfying busy life for these men, often far from home. In an old adobe hut, draftsmen prepare detailed plans of future roads from aerial surveys, for the most part over routes that ground survey teams would take months to cover. Testing materials that will withstand the punishment of heavy transport and extremes of weather is an essential process in the completion of the Beef Road program. Above all, the Main Roads Department watches the efficient operation and maintenance of heavy equipment working in some of the world's toughest road building country. Whilst communications are shared by rail, airline and road, the vehicle bears the brunt of work and must get through. Major highways and beef roads are opening new horizons for coach loads of carefree safari tourists, as on this route across the sheep plains and on to Julia Creek. Minds full of history and bodies stiff from sitting, they're only too happy to find a shady tree for lunch and a cool drink, close to some interesting association with the past. Curious people with a thirst for knowledge, otherwise who'd bump round Australia, make the most of stopovers. To fossick among the old gold mines, shallow alluvial gougings and crude rock huts, abandoned by the disillusioned hunters for the more payable dirt of the copper fields. It's down to earth again with a bang right in the middle of Julia Creek's fine merino country. Back to the volcanic plains, lush Mitchell grass and permanent water. As if drawn by a magnet, pelicans, wild duck and other waterfowl find peace to feed and breed. And magpie geese jet their way to quieter spots. This land of big framed sheep was not seriously affected by a recent drought. Shorn of their heavy winter clothes, sheep jump with joy and head back to their mates around the water hole. For the owners, it's back to the fly screen homestead and fresh clothes to greet a visitor for an enjoyable afternoon tea or dinner on the lawn. It's only a short run to Julia Creek where the quiet unruffled atmosphere is a pleasing change. Sheepmen and their wives quietly go about their business. Local government administration is now a full-time job carried out in modern offices complete with community services and well-stocked libraries for take-home reading. On this badly drought-affected homestead, miles of dried-out soil are grim enough to break the stoutest heart. Unable to be hand-fed any longer, these poor weakened creatures with not enough meat to fill a stewing pot, wool short through lack of food, must be moved to save them. In a last act of kindness, they are gently prodded up the ramp for trucking to yards at Julia Creek for sale. Eyes once swept the sky at the unfamiliar sound of aircraft. From the early days of Qantas in the 1920s to recent post-war years, but now private and commercial planes have broken through the wall of outback isolation. Most of these weakened sheep struggling down the ramp will soon respond to feed. But there are more to move, so it's back along the Normanton Road. A lonely job for drivers to whom the hiss of tyres becomes an endless dirge. Truckies soon know the roads like the back of their hand. To them it's just another job. But to a tourist it's full of interest. How can stock survive on such barren soil? This lonely kangaroo lucky to avoid the shooters or the long-legged dancing brogers on their claypan stage, and emus cautiously out of range. Life also has its lighter side. 
Bushmen love to gather at the annual Sedan Dip picnic races for a riotous day of feasting and merrymaking. With all the atmosphere of a Melbourne Cup, graziers in their broad-brimmed hats, gaily dressed women and rouseabouts with money on the station favourite come from distant properties. And it's no fun without the children to keep the funfair turnstiles ticking. The paddock bookie, perhaps from way off Townsville, lays odds on the grass-fed thoroughbreds, ridden by wiry station jockeys. And until the barrier rises, high fashion dominates the scene. Heads used to craning for rain clouds watch progress by the swirling dust. Like a willy-willy, round the track they race and head for home. Some out of breath and way behind. There's only one word of advice for jockeys. Get out in front and choke them off. By all accounts, a popular win. Though the youngsters seem intent on other things. It's little sleep, if any at all, under the stars or makeshift tents. And so ready for an early morning start. And what a dreary sight for the stragglers. The betting rings strewn with empties. That would never do at Ascot. Leary-eyed, it's north again for home, across Cloncurry River's low-level bridge and along the Beef Road. Off the road, it's back to the well-watered sheep country of Calmeter Station, drained by northern rivers. Its artesian water supply attracting rowdy, greedy cockatoos and other wildlife. Oh, what a lucky break. It's shearing time. And in Banjo Patterson's words, there's five and thirty shearers here are shearing for the loot. So stir yourselves, you penners up, and shove the sheep along. They trim away the ragged locks and rip the cutter goes and leaves a track of snowy fleece from brisket to the nose. It's lovely how they peel it off with never stop nor stay. The youngsters picking up the fleece enjoy the merry din. They throw the crasser up the fleece. He throws it to the bin. The pressers, standing by the rack, are waiting for the wool. Another bale of golden fleece is branded Castle Ray. Women of the West take obvious pride in their homes and make the most of artesian bores to water lawns, a softening contrast to the barren paddocks of Brymine Station, where shearing's also in full swing. But for young Scott Harrington, it's school time, and mustering has to wait. Each day, Scott joins voice-familiar schoolmates across the north on School of the Air, switching to and fro in a two-way lesson with Miss Alexandra of Mount Isa. This, and the mother's help, are the only means of education for the very young, until old enough for boarding school, or living with friends at the Curry or the Isa. The sheep lands still run north, cut by shallow rivers, spanned by bridges, culverts and concrete floodways. Sheep raising in these dingo-infested areas was a chancy business, until a 3,500-mile fence enclosed most of Queensland sheep country north to the Dismals. Low-lying flood country on the Cloncurry River, dismal by name and nature, and worked by main roads and white Russian contractors. They live in rough bush camps, 140 miles from Julia Creek. Lonely construction teams with masses of heavy equipment use every daylight hour to rip through the difficult terrain over the 270-mile stretch to Normanton. Here and there you'll find solitary contractors, percussion drilling for deep artesian water in lonely stretches of country. A grazier safeguard against future drought. A lucky strike, a sudden gush of steaming water. To the water-starved grazier, it's a gold mine, channeled to claypan tanks and billabongs. An assurance of permanent water for stock and birds, no matter what the season. Into the flat cattle country near Donors Hill, an occasional car swirls past. The floodplains of the Cloncurry and Flinders rivers are spanned by long concrete floodways, across which water and debris wash without scarring. A northern curse and voracious eater of every wooden structure is an army of white ants, 
housed in weird sand-built barracks dotting the plains. In the olden days, when homesteads and cattle were frequent targets, many a running fight put troublesome tribes to flight round the hills of the Bang Bang Plains. Before the beef road scheme, cattlemen learned to take floods in their stride, swimming stock across the Flinders rivers at places like Walker's Bend, though many a man and beast swept to their death in swirling waters. Mile after mile of endless plain and scattered homesteads. Suddenly in the distance, a contractor's gang putting final touches to a culvert. It's either too much or too little water in these parts, as road contractors find to their dismay. On this dry stretch, it was necessary to pump supplies from the Flinders River through 10 miles of piping into turkey nest tanks and then boost it to elevated roadside reservoirs. Water is an essential part of soil compaction as the road is formed and rolled before final surfacing. Tough work needs more than meat and each week from far away Cloncurry come medicines and vegetables for camp and homestead. It's hard on family life unless mum and the kids come too and live in air-conditioned caravans with amenities very much like home. But the roads go through. Trade flowed up the Norman River around the 1850s to Normanton, an important town in early northern development. Time means nothing here. Pubs thrive on payday. History breathes through the pores of these old buildings. The original water supply, oil-fed street lamps, and a sentinel-like water tank standing guard over town and hospital. In olden times, a jetty stacked with wool and copper outward bound. And how many fell from this old ferry is anyone's guess. Now, a concrete bridge makes crossing safer. At early light, the ancient Croydon Flyer heads east for 90 miles on steel and proof sleepers. The amazing tidal gulf where the hardy seek the crocodile and barramundi, and in the scrub, many a wartime aircraft lies discarded. Corumba Resort, comfort in the wilderness, where tourists relax with local people and understand a new, uncomplicated life. Where drinks, are strong and tails are long. Rested and curious, it's time to look around, but things are happening here since widespread fishing surveys. What harvest? Sturdy trawlers bringing in tons of raw king prawns and fish. Can this be the revival of once vast native operated fleets that fished the fascinating coastline for pearl, turtle and juicy dugong steak? Today, it's prawn and lobster for cocktails and salads of worldly palates. For local women, it's hard to picture these neatly packed prawn tails gracing the tables of New York Stork Club or the London Savoy. Soon, by road, frozen prawns and tender steaks of baby shark will be in southern capitals. Above the hunter's camp, hungry gulls hover and wait for delicacies from a croc safari way up north by relaxed, sharp-eyed characters whose life depends on the trigger finger. It's a game of stealth, for the scourge of the North has long been dogged by man for its valued hide. The professional hunter, dwindling like the game, loves the life, and leaves for northern mangrove swamps in search of further skins, with scarcely a knob. Heads crowded with memories for a lifetime, our tourist visitors climb reluctantly into charter planes for a flight of over 2,000 miles to the smog and grind of city life. Away they go towards Croydon, above the open plains where the protected plain turkey, once close to extinction, proudly struts and like a cumbersome bomber takes wing. 
Croydon gold was found in 85, and 6,000 miners working fast won 8 million ounces. Built to last like a Roman city, with rock-paved streets and gutters, overnight it died, another ghost town. A new police station guards an old assayer's oven, which spelled success or failure of a miner's claim to riches. No horse and dray today, it's power and speed. But roadside repairs still call for ingenuity and brute strength. Sometimes on your own, but in these parts everybody stops to help. It's desolate, lonely, timbered country of ranging properties, looking with hope to the all-weather beef road of the future. Hungry stock, weary of searching for sparse pickings, wait for a meagre meal of baled hay around the water holes and snuffle hopefully through the trampled straw of a fallen seed. But the cruel drought takes its toll despite incoming loads of coastal feed along the spreading miles of beef road. Round Georgetown, life's been pretty grim as cattlemen and ringers, belts tight, wait and pray for rain. But some lucky ones grind a steady living from semi-precious stones of agates and fossilised wood, but find a ready jewellery market in cities of the world. Only a few hours' flight from Brisbane, the contractors come to see that road work is up to schedule, men happy, and equipment standing up to the tremendous strain imposed upon it. Contracts in this far north country, valued close to half a million dollars, make it worth bringing plant and men from jobs nearer home. On these projects, there's a chance of further work and good profit for the experienced, cost-conscious contractor. The gangs are up with the birds and out at first light ripping and moving the overburden. Huge 25 cubic yard scoops, pushed by dozers, roar through the choking dust to dump their endless loads on a forming road. In places the rock's so tough that ripper feet snap. Giant high pressure tyres pierced by a stone explode like a cannon blast. On into the day, filling, rolling and watering for compaction, the road quickly forms, soon ready for bitumen and screenings. Main roads engineers and surveyors planned this Georgetown Mount Surprise section and nowhere suitable gravel and screening material could be found. All these were thoroughly tested to ensure high quality road surfaces, to minimise maintenance and withstand the heavy cattle lifting operations. From years of experience the contractor knows the volume and specified quality of screenings, which are crushed and stockpiled along the route whilst other phases of the job are underway. Frugal camp life is shared by many wives, most of whom soon accept the noise of continual maintenance. However, some find this life too tough and head back to the lights and easier living. This country has its compensations. The time-chiselled basalt marbles and the turtle rock. At the northern end of the Great Divide, extending from Victoria to Cape York, the Newcastle Range spurs west towards the Gulf, and round its foothills winds the Beef Road, through to the well-watered grasslands of the Atherton Tableland. Off the beaten track, a tourist point, the boiling springs of Talarook are trapped for homestead tanks and waterholes. Even now, the wild forbidding country of the Inesley River tapping the waters of the Newcastle Range resounds to the strained revving of tourist motors. And the pub at Mount Surprise does a better trade than for many years. It's only a stopping point, and they'd better drink deep for long and dusty is the road ahead. Tucked off the road are the green motored homesteads of the north, generations old, where hospitality is legend. Mount Surprise Station, measured in square miles, not acres, is run by a new breed of owner, with two small planes for property inspection. He believes more profit lies in cost control and saving labour by two-way radio during mustering. He flies the station waterholes, spotting isolated cattle. 
and directing hidden stockmen with a minimum loss of time. Like a hawk looking for food, he circles tiny scrub-bound Mount Surprise and sweeps the beef road for people in distress or signs of cattle duffing or potty dodging, a century-old grazier's nightmare. And any wonder at today's high prices, In they come for drafting. Stores are yarded ready for the fattening grasses of coastal properties round Tully, where world-famous King Ranch has invested in a massive clearing and pasture development program that will top off thousands of fats for the meatworks at Cairns. Similar development is well advanced on the Atherton tableland where scientists and local graziers are establishing hardy tropical legumes and grasses for high rainfall areas throughout the north. The means of increased cattle production and a buttress against drought. Much has been achieved by irrigation, flowing through miles of concrete channeling from the giant Tinaru Dam. Just another stockman's problem is the cattle tick, brought from Batavia in 1872. It now plagues large parts of Queensland, still costing millions of dollars in stock losses, damaged hides, and regular dippings to stop its spread by carriers like this lean mob. For several months, these cattle move through various types of improved pasture, until coats bloom and flesh fills out. An entirely different animal now ready for the butcher, steaks for Australians, hamburger meat for Americans, beef for Britain. The experienced eye of an old stockman seems well pleased with this lot as they go through the scales and into trucks. A short trip down the range to the Queerer Meatworks, where with others brought across the beef road system, they finally hang ready for inspection, boning and chilling in export cartons. From across the seas, refrigerated ships sail into Cairns and other ports to stack their holds with first-class beef. All this development is the beginning of an exciting new story of a bold Australian concept, equal in imagination to the Snowy River scheme, and like it, destined to raise our primary production. From the tip of Cape York to the southwest channel country, an ultimate spider's web of thousands of miles of beef roads to railheads and coastal fattening areas will not only bring growth and security to the cattle industry, but development and prosperity to the whole state. <laughs>